Hi there, my name is Alan Chatney, and I'm with Explore. At Explore, we're pretty passionate about what we do. Today I'd like to share some work we've been doing on seismic receiver nodes and the GPS sensors embedded within them. We had a theory that those nodes could position themselves, so the next few slides are extracted from a presentation that we gave earlier this year. I hope you enjoy what you see. So Explore's idea, as it related to nodal positioning, uh, was to use the GPS receiver within each seismic node. And while we knew that any one position from a single frequency receiver within the node is inaccurate and unreliable, we proposed and theorized that by extracting all of the GPS positions and all associated available GPS quality data uh, at the same time as the continuous recording with every node, we could apply a statistical method to compute the final position of each node. If we were right about our idea, we knew that we could eliminate receiver survey entirely, that we could reduce our risk in the field, reduce costs and waste in the field. We thought that we'd be able to get to fully stakeless receiver layout, a huge win for operations, and that itself would facilitate denser receiver designs and provide improved receiver positions. Before we get started talking about nodal positioning, a quick word about conventional survey methods for seismic, for seismic work. Let's just say a line is prepared and it's in the range of three meters wide across uh, the width of the line. The normal method for, prep, for um, survey is to go out in advance and place markers up and down the line. Later on, the recording crew might come and place nodes in different locations along the line, perhaps these would be off to the side. Um, there's a high degree of variability. The other thing that happens is sometimes these go missing. A cow comes along and eats them. Uh, different things can happen and those, those markers can disappear. So there is not always, even though there might be a high degree of precision in the original survey, the relationship of the marker to the survey position and the final position of the receiver may or may not be on the location where the surveyor uh, recorded that position. What we envisioned is that for each node there would be a cloud of points in three dimensions and that any one of those points could be very inaccurate but over a period of several days a cloud accumulates that's concentrated around the node's actual position. So it was with this understanding that we approached the computation of the position of the node prior to using the LIDAR to ascertain the vertical value. We then identify and remove outliers. We incorporate the position dilution of precision values. We incorporate the number of satellites, satellite geometry, and other features, and arrive at a final computed nodal position. For the area in which we ran this experiment, we had acquired both full feature and bare earth LIDAR, both of which are computed from the same point cloud acquired. We then took that extracted bare earth LIDAR surface and integrated those data with the data from the point clouds for each node. In this case, you can see that the nodes are positioned approximately 10 meters apart, and the point clouds intuitively, just looking at the series of clouds, seem to resolve positions of nodes to within a couple of meters. This diagram shows the bare earth LIDAR surface with the point cloud data from the nodes and the computed final position of each node shown as an amber cube. We then take that computed position and correct the vertical so that the vertical ties the LiDAR surface. The next step, as we ran our experiment, was to go out back out to the field and conduct a real-time kinematic survey of the actual sensor positions, and the results were fascinating. This image shows the results of that work. Here, the blue square shows the computed final position of the node, and the green triangle shows the RTK value that was surveyed to a very high degree of accuracy in the field. You'll notice discrepancies of around a meter, in some cases less than a meter, and up to two meters in this diagram. Note here a key difference is that the survey in the field, the RTK survey in the field, is measuring the position of the actual sensor in the ground which could be up to a meter different than the node itself on the end of a 1.2 meter cable. These data show very clearly that the standard error for the derived nodal positions is much smaller 
than the error for the conventional method. Uh, we see a mean value here of approximately 1.6 meters, whereas on the conventional method, it's almost a meter higher. And that conforms with our expectation given our understanding of conventional survey methods. The conclusion of all of this work so far is that nodal self-positioning can work in many seismic applications. It's at least as good as the pre-layout RTK GPS survey method and may be far superior to pre-layout survey in certain heliportable environments. We expect the impact on static corrections and stacking velocities over the useful seismic frequency range to be imperceptible in many seismic applications. Risk and waste will be reduced in the field, and we expect as this method and technology continues to improve, it has the potential to be reliably far superior than the conventional GPS survey method. This can also help achieve high density survey designs and improved subsurface definitions given the overall reduction of risk and effort required to position receivers with nodal systems. Thanks for watching. Hope you liked what you saw. If you did or didn't, please leave your comments down below and share this around. We'd like to get a conversation going as we continue to improve our efforts on nodal positioning.